Hello, my name is Katherine Moore, social worker, mom, coffee lover, and founder of Social Workers Rise, where we inspire social workers to connect, expand their knowledge, and change more lives than they ever thought possible. I'm so excited you found my podcast. We will talk everything social work on every level from micro to macro. We will hear the stories of social workers who are doing big things, learn new skills, and most importantly, give you actionable steps to make a difference today. Let's go. This episode is proudly brought to you by the RISE Directory, a national directory of clinical supervisors who are dedicated to helping the next generation of clinical social workers grow in their clinical skills. The link is in the show notes. Check it out and tell every clinical supervisor you know about this directory. Hello and welcome to another episode of Social Workers Rise. It is your host, Catherine here. This week, we are going to talk about clinical supervision. So about 80% of the people who obtain their master's in social work, they have the goal of becoming a clinical social worker or practicing in a clinical setting or getting their license so that they can provide Uh, private therapy or go on to have a leadership role and supervising other MSWs. So if you are among this 80% of social workers who are seeking clinical licensure, then this is for you. You will 100% encounter clinical supervision in your career field, your career trajectory, because it is mandated by the social work industry to be provided to everyone who is pursuing their licensure hours. So the purpose of clinical supervision is to really ensure that you are practicing in a ethical manner, that you are competent to provide therapy, that you are providing the best possible care for your clients, and to really have that mentor as your supervisor to coach you along this process of becoming a therapist. And additionally, you're going to be talking about all sorts of different topics within clinical supervision. And this can include, you know, what is going on with your clients, the types of therapeutic interventions that are going to be helpful for them, processing your own feelings when counter-transference comes up and transference comes up. How do you handle that? Where is that coming from? You're going to need to process your own traumas and your own stereotypes and judgments and biases. It's a lot of fun, (laughs) but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of hard work that we as therapists need to do within ourselves. And it's important work. It's important that you understand yourself, you understand your client, their situation, you're understanding what you're doing with the types of therapy. So this is really laying the foundation for your career as a mental health professional. Clinical supervision is vital for your learning as a clinical social worker. So This is why I'm surprised that we don't talk about clinical supervision very much, and I don't know why, but we're going to start changing that because it is a really important part of our career as a social worker. So clinical supervision, the the requirements are really all over the place, depending on what state you're in, and this is just focused on the United States right now. So depending on where you are is going to depend on how many hours of clinical supervision you need to to, to qualify for the clinical test, what type of setting you can work in, uh, if it's going to be individual or group, and who is the supervisor going to be. Does it have to be a licensed clinical social worker 
or can they have another degree? And then how many hours can they supervise with those degrees? So it's all extremely detail oriented and it depends on the state that you're in. In general, what I can say is that in order to begin the clinical supervision process is one, you need to complete your social work degree. You're generally going to need your master's degree. You probably will do a form of clinical supervision within your education. So while you're a student, you probably will get a dose of this, uh, this clinical supervision. But what we're going to talk about is really after you graduate, what does that type of clinical supervision look like? And what are your resources available in case you feel like you're not getting the type of supervision that you really need to grow as a therapist? So first, you need your master's degree. And then you may need to apply for a certain type of license or a provisional license in your state. And then after that, you're going to need to pass the social work licensing exam after you have obtained your hours. You're going to need to pass the clinical exam. So that is a very general overview and it is not the same in every state. You need to check your state for what your process is and the link to find the states is in the, the show notes. So it is important to know one, you know, what clinical supervision is, do you need it? If you are practicing in a clinical setting, doing uh, direct work with people, with, with humans in, in your uh, job, then chances are you might qualify as a, as a workplace to get supervision. So a lot of different uh, settings can qualify for it. If you're working with the government, with CPS, with APS, community mental health, foster care, hospitals, hospices, there's a lot of different settings that you can qualify to get your licensing hours. Again, the specific setting is going to re really depend on your state and what your state allows. So for example, um, the, the number of experience hours also depends on your state. And this can be anywhere from a required 1,500 hours of experience in Florida all the way up to 57 hours, 57, it's 5,760 hours. I don't, it's very specific, I don't know why. But in Louisiana, <laughs> that is the, the number that is required. So depending on your state will also depend on how long it takes you to acquire all of these experience hours. For the most part, it's going to take you between 3,000 to 4,000 work hours in order to complete the, the, amount, the work amount needed to qualify for the clinical license. And when you're doing these work hours, this is, you know, the amount of hours that you need to spend doing work, doing face-to-face, -face, doing documentation. Again, the specific breakdown depends on your state. Um, you will also be required to participate in regular ongoing direct supervision. And so the frequency of this depends. It can be anywhere from one hour for every 15 hours that you've seen a patient and anywhere from like two hours a month. It just depends on, on your state and where you are. Uh, the, most, the most common time that it takes for people to acquire hours is about two years if you're going uninterrupted, um, if you don't have any time off, if you don't have a baby, if you don't have any kind of um, leave from work. So it can be about two years and even up to three years if you're in Washington, Alabama, New York, or Georgia. So it really just depends. Additionally, you might have a set time period that you would need to obtain your hours in. So half of the states, they don't specify, you know, oh, you need to obtain your hours within five years, for example. 
but other states have specifications that you need to require all your hours within anywhere from three all the way up to 10 years. And Alaska sets the, the, the maximum amount of time at 10 years. Um, here in California, if you have started your licensing hours and it's been six years and you still haven't finished, then you do need to apply for a provisional license. And then that has even more specifications of rules and regulations that you need to follow. Um, additionally, you know, a lot of times we can find our supervisor through our work. So it is definitely likely that you can find clinical supervision offered at your place of work. However, some of us can't, especially now with social work moving towards technology and so many tech places are hiring social workers. However, they're not necessarily informed on all of these social work regulations and provisions. So it really is up to you to do your research and your homework on your particular state. So each, for you to be supervised, like I said, they must have a certain uh, license de designation. For sure, there'll probably be a licensed clinical social worker. You may be able to have your supervisor be an MFT or a counselor, but again, it depends. So for example, here in California, you can acquire a certain percentage of your hours under an MFT or a counselor or someone other than a social worker. However, once you obtain all of those hours, you still have hours left over that have to be supervised by a licensed clinical social worker. And this is where people come into trouble where they worry that they can't find a licensed clinical social worker. Maybe they don't know one who's providing supervision. So this is why resources like the RISE directory is so important because when you need a clinical supervisor in social work, you don't want to be searching all over the internet and trying to Google someone in your area. That's just not very efficient. So you can go to a resource like the RISE directory, look up your state and your zip code, and see who is in your area that is accepting clinical supervisees and who you might be able to link up with to provide clinical supervision or to get those hours from. Additionally, when your job is the one providing clinical supervision, it may very likely be your direct boss, which some of us are fortunate to have a boss who is empathetic and understanding and skillful and resonates with us. However, some of us are not. Some of us have had supervisors that are not very good. They're not very engaged. They're distracted. They don't honor the clinical supervision time. They, uh, they may even be causing emotional harm or may make us feel traumatized, which I've heard from a number of different social workers that their supervision experience was extremely poor and, and even detrimental in some cases, which this completely breaks my heart. And again, the reason why resources such as the RISE directory are so important is because you know what your choices are you know what your options are. And it's just really important that you know you're never ever stuck. So you have options. The options may not be what you want, but at least they're there. And what I mean by that is, while your job may provide a clinical supervisor that is not ideal, or maybe they only provide it for part-time, at least you know that there are options that you could look into hiring an outside LCSW to help you with those, the rest of the hours that you need. Additionally too, it's important to understand the requirements needed of your clinical supervisor. So again, depending on your state, there will be different requirements that your supervisor needs to meet. For example, some states, 
like in 24 states, the supervisor must be registered and pre-approved. Uh, some states, they must be a licensed clinical social worker and they, uh, they must have a minimum hourly requirement that they're able to, to meet and to provide clinical supervision hours. Uh, again, if here in California, you must have been licensed for two years before you can provide supervision. But in Michigan, I know that that time is much, much less. So you don't have to be licensed for the full two years to provide supervision. So it is important, again, check the link in the show notes to check your state and the requirements that are needed for your state. So after you have gone through these thousands of hours of clinical supervision, that is when you finally get to apply to take the clinical exam and you pass it and yay, you're done. <laughs> Hopefully, I hope that it works out like that for you. Um, some other areas that I did want to briefly mention is that the components of clinical supervision are really going to be threefold. So it's going to be educational and clinically focused, meaning you're going to talk about your therapeutic skills. You're going to help patients uh, through whatever problems that they have and use therapeutic interventions. You're hopefully going to be talking about your therapeutic style and identifying what therapeutic style you enjoy most, which one really isn't working for you, and what are some ones that you like to integrate as well, even though they might not be your primary style. The second component is administrative. So things like documentation, um, hours, just being professional are all areas that we need to continue to learn and practice as we are working towards our LCSW. The third area is supportive. So your supervisor is really going to be the person to mentor you, to teach you, to help you grow, and to find ways to balance your work and personal life, to be supportive in that they encourage you to take your self-care, that they are teaching you ways to manage your stress and anxiety, that we're talking about the effects of vicarious trauma in our work. So they're really meant to be supportive as well. And this is all with the goals of promoting your growth and development, protecting the, the welfare of the clients, also monitoring your performance and constantly evaluating, you know, how are you doing? What are the areas that you're strong in? And then what are the areas that we need to improve in? And then hopefully empowering you to really be your own supervisor and to be able to practice in an independent way, which can be kind of scary and nerve wracking, but rest assured you got this, you got this. Um, lastly, I'm going to close with some qualities of a good supervisor. So if you do find yourself on the RISE directory and you end up contacting them for an interview, you want to be prepared about what you're looking for. So one, you want them to be warm and supportive because you want to be able to be open with this person, to be vulnerable and honest with this person. And at the same time, this person needs to be providing some useful feedback and some constructive criticism to help you grow. They need to have experience as a mental health clinician or in the area that you are practicing or that you want to be practicing in or both, hopefully both. Um, so definitely the experience is a, a really important thing. They need to be empathetic. They need to be able to be present with you and focused. They need to be ethical. Following those ethical guidelines and practices is really important because if we are ethically torn or uh, feeling like our ethics are at risk in what we're being asked to do, then that's going to just make us feel really gross and be a really high contributor to, to feeling burnt out. 
Additionally, they need to have training or some sort of training as a clinical supervisor. So you can, you are more than welcome to ask them what type of training they have gotten for clinical supervision. Some states require a certain number of CEUs, a certain training, but other states don't really require very much. So it might be up to them to pursue additional education to enhance their supervisory skills. Additionally, they need to be able to manage multiple tasks. They need to be good with relationships and they need to be available and approachable. So if you find that this person is just never ever available or never ever returning your calls, I would take that as a red flag that they may not be very available and they may have a lot of other things going on because when you are in a crunch and there's something going on with your client or there's a crisis going on, you wanna be sure that you're able to trust that they're going to be available for you. So I hope this was helpful in just going over the basics of clinical supervision and what you can expect. If you do need a clinical supervisor or if you are a clinical supervisor yourself, definitely check out the RISE directory. It is free to browse. You can even, if you're a clinical supervisor, you can join for free. If you want to have more uh, quality leads and a better return for your time, definitely consider a monthly or a yearly membership where you can put all of your information on there so that people who are looking at your profile they can decide right away if that you, if your skill set would be a good fit for them and what they need. So that is all for this week. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed this episode, please write me a little short review and say, oh my gosh, I love this episode. It was so amazing. Anything to that point, I would love it. Or even just tap five stars in the iTunes app would go a long, long way in supporting the podcast and really helping me continue to get the word out there to other social workers just like you. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. Do you want to make your own podcast? Spotify has a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters. And this is the platform that I use because it makes it so simple to record and distribute your podcast all in one place using your cell phone. What you need to do is download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com backslash podcasters to get started. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Social Workers Rise. If you loved it, please open up your iTunes, tap the five stars, and leave a short note on why you love listening to the Social Workers Rise podcast. Also, if you want to share it on social media, I absolutely love it. You have me fangirling all over you. Take a screenshot and share it and tag me at Social Workers Rise on Instagram and Facebook. Lastly, just want to leave a little bit of legal disclosure here that the information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Social Workers Rise podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done so at your own risk. This podcast should not be used in place of professional advice, therapy, or clinical supervision. And with that, my friends, I'll talk to you next week.